So Persig writes, quote, this may sound as though a purpose of the metaphysics of quality is to trash all subject object thought, but that's not true. Unlike subject object metaphysics, the metaphysics of quality does not insist on a single exclusive truth. If subjects and objects are held to be the ultimate reality, then we are permitted only one construction of things, that which corresponds to the quote unquote objective world and all other constructions are unreal. But if quality or excellence is seen as the ultimate reality, then it becomes possible for more than one set of truths to exist. Then one doesn't seek the absolute quote unquote truth. One seeks instead the highest quality intellectual explanation of things with the knowledge that if the past is any guide to the future, this explanation must be taken provisionally as useful until something better comes along. One can then examine intellectual realities the same way he examines paintings in an art gallery, not with an effort to find out which one is the quote unquote real painting, but simply to enjoy and keep those that are of value. I love this. So that's another point I think we should really drive home is the equivalence between quality and excellence. And he gets into the deeper etymological roots of this later in the book. Um, it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately is that it is competition, which pushes us to excel, right? Even in the, the sphere of sports or markets, right? It is competing with one another that forces us to excel, to become better, to bring out these latent, develop these latent qualities, talents, skills, whatever it may be. And so it's that, again, that frictional process of exchange driving closer to excellence, right? If sport or competition pushes us to excel, it's pushing us towards excellence. And yeah. that is that fundamental cutting edge, pre-intellectual cutting edge of reality that he calls quality. I, I really, really like, not just like, um, the. it goes back to the American pragmatists and this idea that there is no there is no truth as such. There is only what is practical under the circumstances of action, mm -hmm. which does speak again to the idea that we are in a universe that's predicated on action preferences and, and, and value. And that means valuing things and we value excellence and we value excellent action. We value excellent properties. We value so that the concept of excellent or the good, is the guiding principle of everything that we want to excel. And there's, and there's various forms of excellence, right? You know, mm. you can be from the, the, the perspective of Piercing's categories from inorganic to biological, to social, to intellectual, each of those categories has a, let's just say a modality of excellence, which is, which is fundamentally different from the other categories, you know, so you can have excellence in critical thinking, which in no way is going to contribute to excellence in lovemaking right. uh, or excellence in, in physical performance, but they, they will interrelate with each other. They can, give, they can give each other feedback. You know, you can intellectualize how to become better as a sportsman, for example. You're, you're effectively exchanging between these different aspects of consciousness that, that are inter, inter, they're independent of each other, but they are effectively in the kingdom of the psyche, all exchanging excellence between each other. There's excellence mm -hmm. in, in, in thinking, there's excellence in, in, uh, in social skills, there's excellence in emotional intelligence, yes. but ultimately the, 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 the unifying feature of them is this concept of excellence, which is he calls arete, which is from the, the Proto-Indo-European yes. root or arete. Yeah. yeah. Which is where we get, uh, he, he, he specifies that the arete, A-R-E-T-E, -E, I don't fully understand the etymological logic of it, but all of the words that we use that relate to valuing, um, right, wow. for example, yes. worth, they I've have got, R and T that like we've I've got the letters. list right here. So I didn't write, I'll just, I'll just read the list and let's keep going. Go for it. Uh, when he looked up the Proto Indo European root of arete, uh, the important morpheme is that RT sound. Mm -hmm. And there beside arete was a treasure room of other derived RT words arithmetic, aristocrat, art, rhetoric, worth, right, ritual right as incorrect 
Mm -hmm. um, all of these words, except arithmetic, seem to have a vague th th thesaurus-like similarity to quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we say something has worth, we're, we're basically saying it is the manifestation of excellence that we value it. When yes. someone is right, they are providing something that has merit in, in, in the pursuit of something. They're right in an argument. So it, it all comes down to all of those things are forms of valuation, which once again goes back to like Mises and the idea that everything is action. Yes. And action is predicated on, uh, or action is governed by valuing things and pursuing them. Yeah, action is, is an expression. It is all action is an expression of value. We know that in the human domain. I think what Persick's doing here is expanding it beyond the human it's, domain. It's it, exactly. So the, the, and this goes back to that big, the, the thing we spoke about at the beginning is that ultimately our failure to understand the universe as a, as a conscious entity is because we're egotistical. Right. Um, yes. We've got this fallacy that humans are the pinnacle and that everything else is just dumb mass. Yeah, we think we're the and center of the universe again. We think we're the center of the universe. And yeah. it, that's not that's not true at all. We, we yeah. are merely, not only are we unable to perceive that in the environment around us, there could be a higher uh, conscious life form and we wouldn't even understand it the same way that, you know, and and it, I forget who I read and I thought it was a, it was a fascinating feature. Uh, I forget, it was a philosopher that talked about the idea of when you, when you Robert Breedlow, I don't, I don't know if you've got any pets, but let's just say you had a dog. Mm -hmm. You sit down in your armchair in the evening and you, you get a book out and you, you know, you open the book up and you, you give it a good read. Uh, and for like an hour, you're staring at this object and your dog is just sat there looking at you. And he's, <laughs> and he's he, as far as he's concerned, you are just <laughs> staring at a pointless object. Yeah. He can't conceptualize that you're extracting and exchanging with that object through the ruins yes. that are inscribed on the page. For him, it's just, it's noise. So he is unable to conceptualize that there is a deep relationship that you're having with that book because it's in yes. a format that is not perceivable to him. So in the same way, we as, as, as humans yes. would be oblivious to things could be happening in our environment right now, which are deeply high density exchanges of information between conscious elements. Yes. The environment itself, we just look at it and think it's just an object or a dumb set of interactions. But it, it's as egotistical to, to assume that we see everything when you think about it through the lens of that dog. Imagine that dog thinks it understands everything when it watches you read a book. That's so I, I just this thought just occurred to me and then I, I want to dive back into quality. I thought I had last night. So what you're saying there is this this book, this static pattern of value Um. The dog has no comprehension of it, but the the reader is actually engaged in a relationship with an author from the past, yeah. right? Yeah. So through this static technology, if you will, you're actually bending space and time to communicate with someone from the past. Yeah. And then I was thinking of it through the author's lens. The author had to sit down and write the book because he, he valued some future relationship with readers. And that's it's that conformity between the reader seeking out this knowledge and then the author actually seeking the reader that actually brings things into existence over time. Um, so that was just a thought that occurred there. And I, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is, this is where I'm at with the own edge of my thinking, is trying to figure out other ways to understand this how the future calls forth the present, you know, which is the B causing B valuing precondition a, what, what are other ways to think like that? Last night I was watching that YouTube uh, that I sent you of the, the commentary on Leela and you know, her YouTube channel is called a quality existence, right? So I'm sitting there watching it. I pop open my YouTube app and I notice the first thing that pops up on the video, the, the top uh, toggle function is quality. But it's mm. video quality, right? It's resolution. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, oh, that's so that's another way to think about quality is that it is higher quality is higher resolution, right? It's a more accurate picture of an underlying dynamic reality. And so then I was thinking about this in terms of life, how we were basically striving to create static patterns that are more congruent to dynamic reality. 
So in the market, you would say the price, right? The price is this constantly updating static pattern that's intended to report and broadcast to market actors that, hey, this is the current um, relationship between static capital and dynamic demand, but it's something that's constantly updating. So it's a static pattern, but it's constantly trying to broadcast and represent um, dynamic reality in the highest possible resolution. You could also say the tool itself, it's intended to be something that can deal, again, that can bend space and time in an optimal way to benefit the dynamic demand of the user, right? Yeah. So, so a television is a simple example. We all prefer a higher definition television. It's higher quality. Why? Yeah. Because it's a higher resolution picture into reality, right? Now yeah. we look, if you look at an old TV versus the, a new high res TV, it's you're seeing cl more clearly through this tool. And then I would also argue that, you know, the other, and these are pragmatic truths, right? That markets generate prices, tools. And the third one that I put there is virtue. So it's, we're trying to adopt these patterns of action that are most congruent to the underlying nature of purely dynamic reality. And in that pursuit, I think this is why optionality, liquidity, power, political power, these things are all so alluring because it's, they kind of give you this ambiguous, versatile um, force, right? Like we're getting back to the carbon of life that are most closely mapped to pure dynamism. Like money is giving me the most options in any moment to produce, to pursue the courses of action that lead to the production of static patterns that best reflect the unchanging, unchangingly true dynamic reality. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's such a, a massive um, thing to get your head around. Um, it, yeah. And it, it's also, it, it's one of these things that it's also another a quirk of, of language that even the word static, which is what Piercing has used to yeah. select as an embodiment of the principle of it being fixed, even that in itself is not, it's not actually static. It's, it's, it's a stable set of patterns that are changing themselves. Yes. Uh, nothing, Le nothing less dynamic. <laughs> less. Yes. It, yeah. Yes, exactly. It's actually, it would be better to say that there's the ultimate dynamism and then there's lower forms of dynamism yes. that move towards, let's say the perception of stasis. Yes. Um, but even that is, is, you know, like the, it's like the Buddhists, they, they get it. It's like all, all things, everything is change. Yes. Nothing's nothing's fixed. Right. You know, it's just it's just our it's just the way that we it's our lens, it's our glasses again. Yes. Yes. Um so everything is flow and, and we as market participants are we use money because it gives us the best ability to I guess almost like gauge the riptide of progress. It's, you know, it's optimal like, grip on flow, right? It's a, a, it's the the most dynamic static representation of value. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. It's like the, the yeah, it's like the real time feedback of the entire market's contribution to, let's say, the shared enterprise of of world building. Yeah, um, cross history too, by the way, because money is it's a claim on all capital ever produced that still exists. So, and it's, it's funny. It's you know the in quite often people think about surfing, you know, people riding the waves, you know, it's synonymous with, with this kind of almost spiritual pursuit. And it's like riding the crest of a wave or reading yes. the wave. That is almost like the embodiment of this idea of, of um, being in the flow of life. I and mean, it's a random offshoot, but for some reason, when you were talking about the idea of grabbing the flow, that's what surfing is. It's a very yes. spiritual pursuit because it's about reading the patterns of the ocean. Yes in order to acquire that dynamic moment or to experience that dynamic moment, you're, you're having to read the static, the, not the static, the, the, the patterns of the ocean itself. And, yes. and, and the excellence is in riding that wave at the perfect moment in the perfect timing. As close being to in the, the edge as possible. Moment, as close to the edge as possible, the cutting yeah. edge. It's yes. the cutting edge of experience. And um, that is excellence, right? Like if you have a surf contest, excellence. they will yeah. score that guy based on his yeah. excellence and how, how much dynamism he can exhibit without yeah. falling off the board, right? Without breaking the static patterns of yeah. the game. And it, it, it's like when Jordan Peterson talks about what what musters the the in, the 
appreciation of a crowd at a sports event mm. is not somebody that just goes there and phones in a performance. It's the person that's at the bleeding edge of their own abilities that intuitively stimulates the audience to a standing ovation. Yes. It's being on the edge. Yes. And, and that's where, you know, people that push things to the edge, they get to define where the edge is. Yes. Uh, like we need those people. You know, I, I read that, for example, um, with sports, you know, I think it was you who told me this actually, the, the idea that when you look at the world records being broken over time, once one person broke a new world record that was considered to be absolutely un unbreakable, you know, uh -huh. 200 meter sprint in a time, yeah. the next year there was a flurry of new of new yeah, world yeah, records yeah. because once somebody had set the had gone to the bleeding edge and broken it, it changed everyone else's static understanding of what was possible. Right. Yeah. And then people were up to their game, yeah. which is it's 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 like it seems insane to us now, but when um when they made the Bell X1, which is the the plane that was the first to break the sound barrier, yeah. I think Chuck, Chuck Yeager, you know, scientists had had dictated that it was impossible to fly above the speed of sound, right, or faster than the yes. speed of sound. Yeah. And as soon as that first guy like nailed it with the Bell X1, there was just a flurry of innovation with like multi Mac, uh, you yes. know, supersonic jets because because somebody on the bleeding edge had just demonstrated to all the static naysayers that more was possible. Yes. And in, in the act of doing so had shone a light on the potential of the future. Right. And that's what makes us go to a standing ovation because somebody's yeah. pushed it to the bleeding edge, you know, and that's, that's the inspiring feature of humanity. Right. hundred percent. I'm, I'm called to mind again with these discrete jumps, Right. It's like mm. someone like there's so much energy being pushed to the outer shell of our understanding or what we think is possible. And then yeah. when someone breaks through, like all the pressure floods in behind them and populates the next level. And that would once again speak to the symbology of Jesus Christ as, as the, the entrepreneur, right. which is the person that lost it all in the pursuit of, of that bleeding edge. Yes. You know, test pilots that died in the pursuit of breaking the sound barrier, for example, yes, but they yes. were, they were the sacrificial lambs to the pursuit of the, the of excellence and the, the, and the pioneers taking the arrows in the back, right? The pioneers. And that's another theme of interstellar. Uh, I don't know if you, if you get the chance, rewatch the very first teaser trailer. We've always defined ourselves by the ability to overcome the impossible. And we count these moments. The first ever to fly faster than the speed of sound. These moments when we dared to aim higher, to break barriers, to reach for the stars. Gemini 6, you are go. To make the unknown known. We count these moments as our proudest achievements. Having fired the imagination of a generation. But we lost all that. Pulls into port for the last time. Or perhaps we've just forgotten that we are still pioneers, that we've barely begun, and that our greatest accomplishments cannot be behind us. Because our destiny lies above us. just speaking to the idea of you know we used to be pioneers we used to we used to push limits we used to mm -hmm. look to the stars not look at look at our place in the dirt you know and he, and the whole point of that story is that you can never stop the pursuit of of the unknown which is right. why at the end of the film with Matthew McConaughey gets his static house back recreated uh you know and he's there with um with with uh, the, the the robot figure i forget his name yeah i don't care much for this Pretending we're back where we started. I want to know where we are. Where we're going. We got to. We got to move forward. You know, and then he yes. goes back out. He goes at the ending of the film. It's him going again. He never. It's never going to stop. You've always got yes. to. You know, pursue the unknown and, and keep moving. Right. You can't just right, become right. static. Yes. That is life. The dynamism yes. is life. You know. Yes. Hey everybody. 
As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yen Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. All right, I'm going to read this next highlighted piece here. I loved this particular excerpt because in my first read through, I thought subject object duality was like, he's trying to replace subject object duality with metaphysics of quality, but I don't think that's actually the case here. Again, it's more of this per perspectival thing we're describing, whereas you can put on this set of glasses or this set of glasses. It's two different ways to look at the world. He says, quote, or using another analogy, saying that a metaphysics of quality is false and a subject object metaphysics is true is like saying that, a rect that rectangular coordinates are true and polar coordinates are false. A map with the North Pole at the center is confusing at first, but it's every bit as correct as a Mercator map. In the Arctic, it's the only map to have. Both are simply intellectual patterns for interpreting reality and one can only say that in some circumstances, rectangular coordinates provide a better, simpler interpretation. So where this is a, I think what he's creating here is a software update or module that we did not have before, right? It's a whole new way to look at everything, the universe being yeah. reality. Yeah, and it's it, it it's it's like with the general theory of relativity. You know, it, it's it breaks at small and large scales. So, mm -hmm. its value is not in that it's objectively true forever. Its value is that it is a pragmatic model for estimating or for for let's say assessing potential modes of action by having a a map for a specific resolution, the perceivable universe. Yes. Um, or the observable universe, but then it will break down very quickly and it, it goes back to the American pragmatists. But ultimately what he's basically saying here is that scientific theories should be, like you mentioned in, in the previous quote, they should be uh, evaluated in the same way that we evaluate art, which is if it provides a sense of quality or a sense of pragmatic ut utility, or it gives it gives, it gives gives something to you, then use it. Um, and this, this goes back again to Jordan Peterson when he talks about myths and religions mm -hmm. of course they don't have any objective truth but they have truth in in, in what they have codified for social and uh, let's say life philosophy yes that, they're that hyper, hyper real right like numbers. They're, they're hyper real yeah they're hyper real and and it the the hardcore rationalists their inability to see that is it's, it's ironic. It's, it's just, it's, it's sad because you, mm. you know, I now just kind of look at people that have this atheistic bent mm. and just kind of think, well, A, not only uh, is there a sense of you think you know it all and you're, you're not open to these things, mm -hmm. which I understood because I used to be like that. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the more tragic thing about it is their inability to have respect for the hidden architecture of how mm. like Taleb, you know, what I love is with Taleb when he talks about heuristics and he talks mm -hmm. about never dispose of a tradition when you don't know what it's for. Right. Like, like right. fasting, the rationalization for fasting might sound like a religious mumbo jumbo, but it's practical outcome is yes. health benefits. Yes. So don't dispose of it because it's irrational yes. when it's actually highly rational. You just don't know how it works. Right. right and that's right. where I, I, I lose it a little bit with the, the rationalists who think that objective reality is everything and everything else is subjective nonsense. Yes. 
because they don't realize that their lives are governed by the subjective nonsense. Uh, they don't realize that yes. you know, it's, it's, it's blindness. Well, it's, even it's, that, that objective belief or term, it's premised on, and again, we're stuck in the language of subject object duality, but the yeah. ob, quote unquote objective belief or perception is ineradicably based on a subjective interpretation, right? Because yeah. you can just as easily take off a causes B and put on B causes precondition A. The one thing I will say, so this sounds like we're getting into this. It almost sounds like it's a, uh, this is supportive to rel uh, relativism in a way at first. Mm. Cause you're like, oh, it's just a different way of looking at the world. You know, everything it's an, um, another relative way of perceiving things, right? Instead of A causes mm -hmm. B, B causes precondition A. So it almost sounds like it's supportive of postmodernism in a way. But yeah. I think one important point here, and this may be the greatest utility to the metaphysics of quality, is that it actually destroys moral relativism, which is what gets, you know, which is the, what's really corroding social morality today is this belief that, you know, this belief in pure determinism, A causes B, no free will, morals are just subjectively determined, everyone kind of picks their own. There's no, there's no rooting in reality. There's no moral morality is not rooted in reality whatsoever. It's like morality just exists in the mind um, of the adopter, but this metaphysics actually lays out a framework that describes good and evil, right? Describes saying this is um, axiomatically good or axiomatically evil. Um, yeah, I think because one of the things that Piercing does, and I think this this actually relates to what we just spoke about with dynamic versus static, that static is is a false is a false term. What we mean is less dynamic. Yes, it's, it's not yes, it's yes. not static. That's yes. that's a that's a concept that's as obsolete as saying that in a vacuum there is nothing. Yes. So just because you can't see stuff doesn't mean there's not stuff happening. Yes. Piercing does make the observation that with his categories of inorganic, biological, social, and intellectual patterns, that we can, with some degree of pragmatism, overlay subjects and objects, uh, with objects being what we would call inorganic patterns and biological patterns, which yeah. is that we look at our body and say this is an object. We don't look at it and say this is a conscious being. It's like yeah. it's, it's, it's the physical vessel that we drive. Mm -hmm. And then subject is social and intellectual, which is the idea that it, it's it's abstract. But what would be more appropriate to say is that those are just gradations of um, yes. our filter to believe that something that is, let's say, inhuman in its representation, we tend to degrade into just being dead mass. Yes. And that that's the big that's the big fallacy of subject object is yes. that we simply don't uh, we we inappropriately deny lower forms of, of patterns to being conscious and yes. to, to and no, purpose, the no purpose and no goal right and then, so we think that permeates up and into, into nihilism basically yeah exactly and then and then and then we because we attribute falsely the idea that they're deterministic when they're not they're actually the the patterns at the inorganic level are actually just aggregated probabilities that appear to have rules because they're so predictable in the in, yes. let's say the democratic contribution of the atoms mm -hmm. we tend to assign substance the idea that it's just this dead thing yes. and i'm actually going to read out a quote here from piercing on the same chapter and he talks about the idea of a platypus mm, this is very important this inability of conventional subject object metaphysics to clarify values is an example of what phaedrus called a platypus Early zoologists classified as mammals those that suckle their young and as reptiles those that lay eggs. Then a duck-billed platypus was discovered in Australia, laying eggs like a perfect reptile, and then, when they hatched, suckling the infant platypi like a perfect mammal. The discovery created a quiet sensation. What an enigma, it was exclaimed. What a mystery. What a marvel of nature. When the first stuffed specimens reached England from Australia around the end of the 18th century, they were thought to be fakes made by sticking together bits of different animals. Even today, you still see occasional articles in nature magazines asking, why does this paradox of nature exist? The answer is, it doesn't. The platypus isn't doing anything paradoxical at all. It isn't having any problems. 
Platypi have been laying eggs and suckling their young for millions of years before there were any zoologists to come along and declare it illegal. The real mystery, the real enigma, is how mature, objective, trained, scientific observers can blame their own goof on a poor, innocent platypus. Zoologists, to cover up their problem, had to invent a patch. They created a new order, monotremata, that includes the platypus, the spiny anteater, and that's it. This is like a nation consisting of two people. In a subject-object classification of the world, quality is in the same situation as that platypus. Because they can't classify it, the experts have claimed that there is something wrong with it. And quality isn't the only such platypus. Subject-object metaphysics is characterized by herds of huge, dominating monster platypi. The problems of free will versus determinism, of the relations of mind to matter, of the discontinuity of matter at the subatomic level, of the apparent purposelessness of the universe and the life within it are all monster platypi created by the subject-object metaphysics. Where it is centered around the subject-object metaphysics, Western philosophy can almost be defined as platypus anatomy. These creatures that seem like such a permanent part of the philosophical landscape magically disappear when a good metaphysics of quality is applied. This is a very important concept, the, the platypus being an animal that came along and completely buggered up biologists' kind of definitions of mammals versus, I forget the other Reptiles. Term. Reptiles, which is yeah. the, the defining feature of the category of reptiles is that, what is it, they lay eggs, but they don't, yes. they don't look after their young. And the defining feature of a mammal is that they don't lay eggs, but they, they nurture. Yeah, they, they, I think breastfeeding was the mammalian character. Yeah. And then suddenly they discover this bloody platypus and it doesn't fit into either category. Yep. And instead of saying, well, our categories are false, they just kind of go, well, this is an illegal animal. <laughs> like, yes, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> so the platypus, you know, has the duck bill, it, it lays eggs and it nurses its young. So it, yeah, it, so it, it blew out all the categories. And all the categories suddenly, you know, yeah. with if, you, if you're humble, you would say our categories are wrong. Now yes. let's reconsider the situation yes. here. But that's not what they did. They just made a new category, which is this piercing. Is, uh, it's this like having the, a country with one citizen. <laughs> yes, yes. This is the, uh, we're talking about Talab, the Procrustean bread, Procrustean bed, right? Where you start cutting yeah. the observation to fit your model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of reevaluating the model. It's left hemispheric certainty, which is, yes. which, which means that you try and distort things to fit your existing model because you think it's true. It's human egocentricity and arrogance, right? Yeah, it is. It is totally arrogant, no. um, which, you know, and I, I come, I say that not, not in some dismissive sense. You know, I, I was a hardcore atheist rationalist for Same some time. Here. And I look Same back here. and just think, what a dickhead. Um, yeah. Maybe this is an equivalent actually. That, so matter is an illusion as well. What we interpret as matter, you know, Einstein taught us is energy. It's more static energy, or we'd say less dynamic energy, which we, in this lingo, we could say are static patterns of energy, if you will. So energy, like photons, light is purely dynamic. Maybe this is actually a reflection of dynamic quality in some way. Pure light, you know, it's timeless. Um, whereas matter is something, it's energy or light that's been slowed down and frozen in a way in these static forms. And that's everything. That's the whole universe. The whole universe is only energy, matter, space-time. But we think space-time might actually be... Uh, a uh, uh, quality of our perception. Yeah. And it, it, it's effectively, it, it's almost like the challenge is to, we, we've spoken about the importance of logos, the word, the word mm -hmm. is what allows us to value and perceive reality. And we, if we have words, which, which are pre-programmed to, to imply certain meanings, then it yes. distorts our, our, let's say our, our ability to observe right. with the highest level of excellence. Like we, yes. we can't observe excellent with excellence if we've got 40 glasses and one of the features like even the words you used earlier like froze frozen mm -hmm. it implies something becoming fixed in in time yes. um, and, and holding which is which is another illusion what yes. like he says what would be more appropriate is to say that um when something is frozen it is a highly stable inorganic pattern of value right in the over time with a time lapse you would see that it's not frozen at all yes um, it's only with our temporal resolution of that we no. as conscious beings on this plane experience yes we can we can have we can have the illusion that it's fixed substance yes but 
this is why he hated Aristotle and I hated he resented Aristotle oh. because Aristotle gave us those glasses that have caused the confusion that have been around for like thousands of years and they right. popped and that those confusing glasses were given to everybody in yes. the western world yeah and yeah and the, the um it's almost as if consciousness is surfing the edge of that wave right like we mm. maybe we are the best biotechnology for interpreting or, or experiencing dynamic quality that would make sense but then we also but to define or create or communicate these concepts we have to create static again in quotation every time we use the word static we're just saying less dynamic right everything's yeah. dynamic quality stable a, stable stable like there's, stable there's kind of, over time yes and i love this analogy actually because you have the speed of light we could say yeah. right that is represents dynamic quality yeah. and then everything moving below the speed of light that is matter mm -hmm. is our forms of static quality or less yeah, dynamic yeah. quality yeah. um and this like the punchline there where you talked about the glass of water if there's there has to be something which inheres it right the substance does not explain what what causes it to inhere and this is something that's been talked about for a long time, there's some uh, John Verveke calls, I think, structural functional organization uh, or the gestalt, which we don't really mm. have a word in English for this, but there's a, I think it's a German word, gestalt mm. or the bow plan. This is like, this is saying that what makes a bird a bird, right? It's not just a beak, feathers, wings, bones, eyes. You could put all those things in a cup and throw them up in the air. But that that's not a bird, right? There's some structural yeah. pattern actually that that defines the bird. We would only say yeah. that as a bird is if it's actually doing that thing. So there's this, this and I don't know the the intuition I have here is that again it's about relationship, right? It's about yeah. emergent properties are what define life, and emergent yeah. properties arise from considering the relationships among things, not just summing yeah. the things together, right? That's what a, an emergent property is when something is more than the sum of its parts. And it is more than the sum of its parts because of the versatility of its interactions. It's mm -hmm. not just the, so we think, I think subject object metaphysics forces us to think in terms of elements, like, oh, I just put yeah. all these ingredients together and then the, there's the thing. Yeah, But it, it, it does not, I guess metaphysical quality is looking at it more from a relational standpoint. Well, yeah, and and this is where the the terminology, which is 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 so frequently used in in the Bible, which is the idea of kingdoms, mm -hmm. the kingdom. Well, a kingdom is effectively a closed system of market participants in a mutually cooperative community. Mm. What's a bird? A bird is a kingdom. It's a, it's a closed system of mutually beneficial cooperations happening with this immune system yes. of, of it's both um, protecting itself from the environment that could kill it, but also uh, is optimized to, to, to benefit from the environment. So it's, it's in a, it, it's effectively the, the whole world is, is, is a marketplace of kingdoms within kingdoms within kingdoms. Yes. Yes. Even the cell that you posted on Twitter uh, a few days ago, mm -hmm. like you said, it's it's a small marketplace of, yes. of of exchanges and relationships happening with these these very low level cellular entities that have very simple transactional preferences. Yes. That that it, that that have found themselves beneficially maintaining stability by going into cooperation with each other. So this this is um where I'm trying to get to like what life is. And I've said that it's, it's more like there are strategies. And I use the word strategies because a strategy will adhere to the static laws, right? It will respect the static laws. It'll play by the rules of the game. But if there's an opportunity to breach the rules of the game to its own favor in whatever way, right? If we, like, if we're trying to overcome gravity as life, well, as human beings, we kind of, break the rules of the game by shooting into orbit, right? All of a sudden we've defied gravity to the highest extent. So there are these, the principles themselves, if I just said a law, a law sounds like something fixed and unchanging, but it's the strategy that's almost like a liquid law. Like it's going to coalesce to the invariant patterns in its domain, but it's seeking to overcome it at the same time to its own benefit. So mm. these, 
it's almost like that maybe these strategy, the structural functional organization or the gestalt or the bow plan is like the strategy of the organism, right? It's yeah, taken yeah. all these static patterns and put them together, but it's animated by a strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So I, never, I haven't thought about it this way, but this clarifies something. Cause like we just said, an object isn't an object. It's merely a stable set of patterns mm -hmm. that we can experience in our temporal resolution as being consistent. Mm -hmm. But actually what, what it is, is in real time is a compound is a compounding series of, of interrelated strategies or coalescing and giving the impression of stability and coherence and consistency. Yes. But actually it's all in dynamic flow of time. So it's not objects. It's just, it's stacked strategies yes. that, that, you know, a bird is a set of strategies. And when I say a set, I mean, millions of strategies. I mean, yes, there's, there's red blood cells, there's white blood cells, there's yes. cellular activity. There's, there's, you know, microbiology, there's, yes. there's, it's a, it's a series of exchanges that are, that are ranking into the millions and that in its totality, the emergent property of that is, is dynamic life. Right. Actually, it, dynamic life is an emergent property of all of these discrete strategies operating in a marketplace of what we would call the bird, which is yes. the, the word that we've generated to summarize those millions, strat those millions of strategies working in, 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 in real time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And weird. That, when you think about it, like we, we are, you and me, we're both yes, just, of course. we're just, comp we're compound strategies, which yes. means that, which, which confirms the, the framework of, of, Mises like action, which is action is strategy. So, yes. so if, if all we are is compound strategies, then, then the, uh, the, the action itself is, is, is you can, in, you can infer that that's what yes. is the excellence that all of those strategies are, are moving towards. And this, and these strategies, the, I think the overarching aim is typically it's territoriality, right? They're trying to expand yeah. their dominion over space and time. So you, you're trying to typically occupy some space, protect the space for purposes of reproduction. So you're actually uh, proliferating the survival strategy that is encoded in your genetics across time. You want to make more of you, right? More, you want to propagate your survival strategy. And so all of those that the countless strategies you described composing and animating a bird, those are all encoded in its genotype, right? So its DNA is basically the blockchain of the bird, if you will, it's its entire history of interactions and transactions with its environment. And that genotype expresses itself in life as the phenotype. The phenotype is the bird, the feathers, the beak, the eyes, and all of these things. But with, in biology, they also talk about animals having extended phenotype. So this would be the beaver building the dam or the bird building the nest, right? They're creating these tools of fitness for them. And I think for human beings, we express these extended phenotypes in property rights, right? Like this is the tool, this is my territory, whatever it may be. So this whole, that ties money because money is the ultimate property, right? Essentially. Well, it's, and, and this is another, now we're going down this rabbit hole of reconceptualizing these terms that might, might have linguistic, let's say bias, when I think of the word property rights, I think of, I think of the static acquisition of, of dead land, for example. Right, right. And, and actually, property rights is, like you mentioned in a previous podcast, it's a relationship. It's, it's right. a contractual relationship. And if we, if we acknowledge that the property itself is, is let's say, a low-grade consciousness, we're actually just building more and more connections between all of these different strategies. It's, yes. a, it's, it's well, the it's most. All, the most yeah. basic level of property actually is you, you are self-owned, yeah. right? Yeah. That's, that's you own yourself and your consciousness and your body and your time, right? Only you, Mike can control yourself. No one else can actually control you. Uh, that then can be infused with nature. You can spend your time, effort, energy, skills, talents on creating something of use or value. And that is you basically your genotype, extended into your phenotype which is your body your limbs your talents now extending itself again so this is survival strategy echoing outward right to to help create the world around it but then your creations actually now need to compete with others which you compete with others through trade right 
And then on balance, the whole, the collective human genotype, the collective human superorganism, if you will, is becoming more energy efficient. It's better able to claim territory in the world. And that's indeed what's happened, right? We function as a collective organism through our, through sharing our extended and intermixing our extended phenotypes to conquer the world. No other animal can do that because every other animal is just concerned with their little immediate, you know, domain. They can't communicate with each other across time and space the way we can. I've not conceptualized a lot of this stuff in this way before, but it's all, it's all strategies, value strategies. Yeah. This is universal Darwinism.